Hi, Mindsetters, and welcome. All you grade 12 learners, we are busy revising genetics and inheritance, a topic many of you love to hate. Yet, we're going to show you today that this is not a topic to hate. It's a topic where you can score marks, providing you do the homework. The homework includes learning the correct terminology and applying this terminology to solve problems as we go along. Let's see where we're going to. So what do we want to actually learn today? We want to see the difference between genetics, inheritance, and variation. Or rather, we want to explain these terms. Secondly, we also want to know how to outline experiments conducted by Mendel. Now, there's two ways to do this. We can simply draw diagrams, ordinary diagrams, or we can use genetic diagrams. And I'm not going to explain all that now because we're going to talk about that as we go along. You must also be able to explain the difference between each of the following terms. And this, guys, is the basis of whatever you're going to do after this. So it's important that you understand these concepts before you attempt solving problems. These words will tell you what to do in a problem. First one is, and this is not only in genetics but in meiosis as well, chromatin and chromosomes, the difference between these two. You must also know the difference between genes and alleles. Phenotype and genotype. Dominant and recessive alleles. You must be able to state Mendel's law of dominance. You must also know what's the difference between homozygous or pure breeding and heterozygous or hybrid. You must also be able to explain what is meant by monohybrid cross and what is meant by a dihybrid cross. These are the terms that are going to guide you through your work. Without any further ado, let's see how much of these things you know already. The first question says, and taken from March 2013, paper one, question one, says, explain the principle of dominance. Now, this word dominance is an English word. It's not a biology word, but in this principle, it is applied in a biological sense. And it's linked to Mendel's work. The law of dominance. The law of dominance refers to the situation when we have two alleles together. Remember, a gene is the part or, 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 or the, 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 the simplest unit that controls inheritance or characteristics. That means whether you have blue eyes or brown eyes, controlled by genes. Not the ones you wear, J-E-A-N-S, no, not that one. G-E-N-E-S, the ones that make you. That's the one we're talking about. This gene is made up of two alleles. Generally, two alleles. These alleles can be identical, they code exactly the same, or they could be different. That's where the term we spoke about earlier, homozygous and heterozygous, comes in. If it's homozygous, it means the two alleles in the gene are identical. For example, they both code for blue eyes. When they are heterozygous, it means the two alleles are different from each other. One may be coding for blue eyes, and one may be coding for brown eyes. I'm glad I chose eye color as an example, because it can help me to explain this dominant story. So in terms of dominance, let's take the example of the eye color and the heterozygous individual. The heterozygous individual had one allele for brown eyes and one, eye for, uh, one uh, allele for blue eyes. When these two alleles come together, the one for brown eyes and the one for blue eyes, we say that this is the genotype of this individual. This individual is heterozygous for eye color.
Now you'll notice we wrote there one letter is in capital B and the other letter is small b. Now if you look at it, it already tells you that something is more emphasized and something is less. In this case, the capital letter is more emphasized. And this capital letter refers to the brown allele, the one that's co coding for brown eyes. And hence, in this particular example, the allele for brown eyes is dominant over the allele for blue eyes. And the individual, therefore, will have brown eyes. So what does this tell us about the law of dominance? I've used an example. Let's put it into words now. I've already alluded to the fact, in a heterozygous condition, the dominant allele expresses itself in the phenotype. So when two alleles are together in a heterozygous individual or condition, then the dominant gene will be expressed in the phenotype. Phenotype, phenotype for, for phenotype for, for features. That means what we can see. When we look at this person, we can't see whether he's homozygous or heterozygous. But we can see whether he has blue eyes or brown eyes. That blue, those blue eyes or brown eyes that we can see is known as the phenotype. The outward appearance or expression of the genetic condition. And whether the individual is homozygous or heterozygous, which we can't see, is known as his or her genotype. You'll notice just from using this one example and this one question, we have covered already many words, dominant, homozygous, heterozygous, recessive. We have covered those things, phenotype, genotype. Or we can say when two individuals with pure breeding contrasting characters across the F1 generation all display the dominant characteristic. So in a situation like this, what we are saying, one is stronger and one is weaker. The one that is stronger will express itself outwardly and is known as the dominant alien. This is the law of dominance. Mendel put it this way, for every characteristic, there are two factors that control it. When these two characters, factors are different, the one that is dominant masks or shadows the other one in expression. That means it won't show in the individual. The next law we want to know is law of segregation. What is Mendel's law of segregation? I just told you now, Mendel said that for every characteristic in an organism, it is controlled by two factors. We know from meiosis and reproduction that we don't talk about factors anymore. We talk about two alleles. And the law of segregation says that each characteristic is regulated by two alleles, that we're calling it, which separate during meiosis so that each gamete contains only one of the allele or factors. Now, what are we saying here, people? We're saying, for example, humans have 46 chromosomes. When meiosis takes place, each sex cell or gamete has only 23 chromosomes. This is what we're saying. So the individual gametes have half the chromosome number. So that comes back to this here. When these alleles are together, they separate during meiosis so that each gamete will only have one, which is half of two. So half the chromosomes, hence half the alleles. So this is what we are talking about here. In other words, if we have a gamete now, sperm, and we're talking about brown eyes and blue eyes, we can't have a gamete with BB or BB or B, B. We can't have that type of a gamete because that means it has two alleles. And that means when it fuses with an egg, instead of having two, it will have three or four. And that's not good. That's a problem. So therefore, we don't have this situation. 
We don't have this situation. Rather, if this is the sperm, it will either have capital B or, or small b. Can't have both. Okay? And it can't have two big b's and it can't have two small b's either. That's what the law of segregation says. Now, the next question says, distinguish between complete, incomplete, and co-dominance. So in other words, we, we learned the law of dominance. Now we want to apply that to three different situations. What are those three situations? Complete, incomplete, and co-dominance. Complete dominance is easy. The story of the blue eyes and the uh, brown eyes, where one completely dominates the other one when they put together uh, the recessive gene or the recessive allele does not show, is not expressed in the phenotype. So that is complete dominance. What about the other two? So the first one says, when two individuals with pure blooding characteristics are across the F1 gene, all show the dominant characteristic. This is complete dominance. One is completely dominant, the other one is recessive. However, we also have incomplete. In incomplete, neither allele is completely dominant over the other, such that the offspring, when homozygous individuals are crossed, show a new characteristic. For example, we take white cows and we made them with black bulls, we find that the offspring are gray. So white and black are not dominant to each other at all. So therefore, we get an intermediate color called gray in this particular example. So two things in incomplete. Neither of the two alleles are dominant, one. And two, the resultant offspring, when the two alleles are crossed, results in an, a blend between the two characteristics. And lastly, co-dominance. Co, co-partners, co you share equally. Co-dominance, both, equal, both alleles are equally dominant. And therefore, the offspring, again, remember, I'm not writing it, but the offspring between two homozygous of these two uh, contrasting characteristics will produce offspring that show both characteristics. And I like to use the same example. If we mated white cows, homozygous for white, and black bulls, homozygous for black, and all the individuals were black and white. In other words, white with black spots or white or black with white spots. I mean, white with black spots, sorry, or white with black spots. So that's what we are saying there. What has happened? They are equally dominant, so therefore both are showing there. A classic example of this is shown in the blood groups A and B when homozygous a person who is homozygous for blood group A crosses with a person who is homozygous for blood group B, their offspring are all blood group AB. So that means A and B are co-dominant, hence the offspring show both of the phenotype. What's the difference between heterozygous and homozygous? We've spoken about this already. Heterozygous, when alleles are different for a particular characteristic. Example, B, B, or G, G, or R, R. They're not the same. One is coding for something and the other one is coding for something else. Of the same characteristic, but differently. Homozygous, when the alleles are identical for a particular characteristic. If we're looking at R, it could have been R, R, capital R, capital R, or small r, small r. Here, it would be b, b, big, or b, b, small. g, g, big, or g, g, small. These are all homozygous, oopsie, 
homozygous individuals there. All of them are identical. Here you can see they're not the same, so they are heterozygous. Phenotype and genotype, I've already explained that to you earlier. For, for phenotype, for, for features, the physical outward manifestation, big word, appearance of the genes. That means we have these genes, how are they showing outwards? How do we know what they're showing? We have to look at the color of the eyes, the size of the nose, the shape of the eyes, the texture of the hair, the color of the hair, the height of the person. The genes are inside, you can't see them. But they are resulting in something that you can see. This, the result is called the phenotype. The genotype is the genetic makeup, which can be either of two things, homozygous, if they are identical, or heterozygous, if they are different. That's all we are doing there. What is the difference between harmful, harmless, and useful mutations? Obviously, before we talk about harmful, harmless, and useful, we must be able to talk about what is a mutation. A mutation is any change either in the gene, DNA, or the nitrogenous base sequences, or in the chromosome. If it affects the genes, it's called a gene mutation. And if it affects the chromosome, it's called a chromosome -mosome mutation, or we can say it is a chromosomal aberration. Those are the terms that we use. So if it's affecting the chromosomes, it's a chromosomal aberration. If it's affecting the gene or the DNA or the sequence of nitrogenous base, it's called a gene mutation. Now, both in both cases, we can get these three types. And this is all you need to know, one of these three. You'll notice the old papers and the old textbooks talk about fixed or rather point mutation and frame shift mutation. For your studies, you don't have to know that. You need to know harmless harmful and useful or fixed. And they're very simple, it's English words here. I'm not gonna waste your time with that. Straightforward, harmful mutation generally will call ha cause harm to the organism. Many times it is lethal or fatal. So you'll also hear the word lethal mutation. A lethal mutation causes the death of an organism. It is so harmful that it causes the death of the organism. Harmless, as it suggests, does not affect the organism at all. We also call harmless new mutations, we call them neutral. Neutral, why? Because they have little or no effect on the organism. There's no benefit and there's no harm. Useful or fixed. Mutation is such that it gives an organism an advantage over others, thus favoring this organism's chance for survival. That means because this organism has a better outlook or whatever it is, what characteristic that it has, it makes this organism better than others in its surrounding. Hence, this one will survive and the others will die. So because it favored this organism, we say that it's a useful mutation. And the, because this thing will stay there now because it was a something that was like an upgrade for this organism, it becomes fixed, it stays there. Fixed means it stays there forever. Good? These words here will give you a problem. Genetic engineering and biotechnology. That's semantics, I say. Genetic engineering is a deliberate modification or altering the characteristics of an organism by manipulating its genetic material. What does all this mean? Such a many words here. We're simply saying that when humans alter the genetic makeup 
of an individual. This is known as genetic engineering. That's what we are saying. We are changing the genetic material, but why? Why do we want to change it? To suit us. For example, we can modify the genes of certain crops so that they become drought resistant. That means in times of drought and dryness, they will not be affected. Biotechnology is the use of biological processes or organisms or systems to manufacture products intended to improve the quality of human life. Now, what are we talking about here? An example would be the manufacture of insulin. We're using technology, we're using an organism, bacteria, and we use the gene for insulin, all of this together to produce the insulin that we can use for sugar diabetes. We have learned about complete dominance, incomplete dominance, and co-dominance. We are giving you examples now, and we want you to classify them as one of those three. That means they can only be one of these three. Clue is, look at the results. So the first one, A, we took yellow corn, we crossed them with red corn, and all the offspring were red. Clearly, that is an answer, or rather that's a case of complete dominance. Why? Because one of the two colors completely dominated the other one. And our answer tells us that red is dominant over yellow in this particular example. If we take brown dogs and we made them with white dogs and we get a brown spotted dog, brown with white spots, then the answer has to be co-dominance. We must, however, say here brown with white spots, huh? or white with brown spots. But that shows that both are coming in the uh, offspring, so it's co-dominance. Yellow fish and red fish. And the result is orange fish. Yellow, red, orange. Orange is new or intermediate. And therefore, that one would be incomplete dominance. A blue flower with yellow flowers. And we're getting one blue, two green, and one yellow flower after several. Remember, you won't get it from the first generation. One blue, there's a blue, two green, and one yellow flower. Remember, I'm going to repeat, from the blue and the flower, yellow, you won't get it immediately. This will be after several generations only. But the fact that we got green here is also an intermediate color that will tell you that this is also incomplete dominance. So look at those examples again. Yellow, red, red, complete. Brown, white, brown with white spots, co. Yellow, red, orange, incomplete. Blue, yellow, green, incomplete dominance. That should help you to understand the terminology, to master the terminology, so that when we go a step further, you'll be able to solve at least monohybrid problems. With that, I'll give you a small break where you can wet your mouth with some water and take a small break, get some tea, coffee, etc., and come back and be reinvigorated to move on with the session. Hi guys and welcome back from your break. I'm hoping you had a small break and you did what you had to do and you're ready to roll with us in the studio. Good. Question two. We have dealt with all the terminology. Now, If you follow your exam guideline, you'll see what I'm going to do now actually comes later. But I felt that we'd rather get rid of the theoretical parts first and then we go into solving problems. This deals with genetics and society and the ethical problems, etc. we have with genetics and so on. 
But we're doing it now because it's more theoretically based. And when we start with problems, we move one way with all the types of problems. So where we are, read the passage below and answer the questions that follow. People, you should get used to things like this. This is what we call a case study. They're giving you an article or a scenario, and then they will ask you questions. Remember, you have to read the passage carefully, underlining keywords, etc. We're going to do it once so that we do it together, and thereafter answer the questions so that you learn the skill. Let's go through it. First of all, they are talking about genetically modified pig bred with good fat. So the term that comes out is GM. And this is the section that this falls under the syllabus, genetically modified organisms. So under genetics, how can we change organisms by changing their genes, etc.? And this is where this is coming in. And at the same time, what are the advantages of this? What are the disadvantages of this? Okay. So scientists in the United States of America have produced genetically modified pigs with fat containing omega-3 fatty acids. These fatty acids, which are usually found in salmon, mackerel, and fresh tuna, are thought to be responsible for a number of benefits. So in other words, they're saying to us that the omega-3 fatty acids are beneficial to us. And they're telling you where we normally find them. In other words, they're saying that pigs normally don't have this. What are these benefits? Combating heart disease to improving intelligence. Wow, I think we need to have a lot of that omega-3 so we can improve our intelligence and at the same time protect our hearts. Researchers from the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine created piglets capable of converting less useful omega-6 fatty acids into omega-3 fatty acids. So in other words, they modified the genes of these animals such that they could turn omega-6 fatty acids, which according to this article, are less useful, into omega-3 fatty acids, which the article told us earlier, are useful. They implanted 1,800 embryos into 14 female pigs, 10 live offspring, which were able to make high levels of omega-3 acids were born. <coughs> so out of 14 female pigs, they got 10 live offspring. This article has been taken from a Cape Argus newspaper, 27 March 26, 2006. So the question says, name two health benefits of omega-3 fatty acids. Now guys, for your syllabus, you don't have to know about omega-3 fatty acids. So when they ask you for these benefits, don't scratch your head. The answer is in the article. And we discussed that answer, so I'm not going to go back to the article. I'm just going to open the answer for you. That was combating heart disease and improving intelligence. Get it from the article. If it's not in the article, that means you're supposed to have known it. And then you can scratch your head. But till then, take the answer as far as possible from the article. What percentage success did the scientists have with the implanted embryos in forming? What percentage, sorry, what percentage success, come on, with the implanted embryos in forming a clone of pigs capable of producing omega-3 fatty acids? Show all working. Remember, some of these things you can do on a calculator and you get your answer. They want to see your steps. Now, we have to go back to the article and look at the numbers. How many did we get? We got 10. We got 10 of them. And how many did we implant? We implanted 1,800 of them. So out of the 1,800, we only got 10. So that's our clue, and that's where we start our answer. So we got how many? We got 10. Out of how many? 1,800. So it's 10 divided by 1,800. And we want a percentage, so we multiply it by 100. 
And the answer is 0.55%. Okay? To produce genetically modified pigs, the gene that produces omega-3 fatty acids is inserted into the pig embryos. Describe the steps in forming and introducing many copies of a desirable gene using bacteria into the pig embryo. So this is now the theory. It's not from the article. The article did not explain this. So we need to explain it from our work that we learned. First of all, the gene responsible for producing omega-3 fatty is located, we have to find it, in the DNA of salmon, fresh mackerel, or tuna. We go to those organisms, we isolate that particular gene, and we will then remove this gene from the donor. So we'll take a cell out. Remember, we're not going to kill the animal for this. We remove a cell in the body, we isolate that particular gene, and we cut it using enzymes. And then we insert that into a plasma. So in other words, if this was the gene, let's get colorful. If this was a chromosome, for example, and this part here, now let's see if I can. Yeah, let's say this part here, this orange part, is the part that is coding for omega-3 fatty. So what we're saying is that we're going to cut that part off. I'm going to do it a, a different direction. I'm going to cut the other ones out to leave that one out. So we have removed that one. And what's the next step? We put it into a plasmid of a bacterium. So the plasmid of the bacterium is a circular ring of DNA. If that was the plasma of the bacterium, we will then cut away a portion there. And in that place of that portion, we are going to add this gene that is coding for omega-3 fatty acids. That's what they're saying here now. So we put it in a plasma of the bacterium. This bacteria then makes more bacteria. It undergoes binary fission or ordinary mitosis to make more. And mitosis is exact duplication. It means whatever it has is going to make more and more and more of that one there. Then these genes are inserted into the cells of the zygote or the embryo. And in that way, when those embryos are born, they have this new gene in their makeup, and they become uh, the omega-3 friendly ones. Give two reasons why some people may support the use. Now, this is a nice question saying some people may support it. In other words, what are the advantages? That's all they want to know. And the advantages are? We can get healthier for, it's healthier for humans to eat, combating heart disease. It can mass production of healthy fat, and it can improve intelligence. So these are the advantages for that. Some people may be against it, however. So that is the disadvantages. And what are those disadvantages? They are going to be general, whether you're talking of cloning, whether you're talking of genetically modifying organisms or interfering with nature in any way, there are certain fixed disadvantages or arguments against. First of all, you may get cultural objection because, say for example, myself, I can't eat anything from a pig. I can't use anything from the pig. So I'm not going to use that particular omega-3. So I've got a cultural problem with that. No good for me. The success rate of this particular experiment is very low, 0.55%, less than 1%. So much of money is put into it, but you're getting a success rate of less than 1%. Uh-uh, 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 think of something else. So it's an expensive procedure, that two go together. There's no value for vegetarians. This is also again there. The vegetarian can't eat this one here. 
any objection to eating any genetically modified organism. More than that, we are interfering with nature. You can use that as an objection. And last but not least, we do not know the long-term effects of GM food. So those are some of the reasons why people may object to using genetically modified organisms. We move on to question 2.2. Cow's milk is different from human milk. Obvious. It's obvious, yes? Cow's milk should not be given to young human babies. When the baby is born in the infancy, it is not healthy to give that particular child directly undiluted cow milk. Hence, you'll notice the child will either be breastfed or the child will be using some form of powder milk. Scientists in China have genetically engineered cows to produce human milk. Wow! Milk from these cows can be given to very young human babies directly. First question and something we've answered already. What is genetic engineering? Genetic engineering is the deliberate modification or altering of the characteristics of an organism by changing its genetic material, by interfering with its genetic material. Suggest the reason why some people are worried about using milk from genetically engineered cows to feed human babies. Here's the story again coming up. Same, question, same, same answer, different question. We don't know the long term or the side effects on the baby. In other words, we're not sure how safe this is on the baby. So we don't want to change, we don't want to take the chance. Not everybody's going to go for this particular way. Question 2.3. A group of grade 12 learners were asked to test the following hypothesis with regard to phenotypes. At each age group, Boys are taller than girls. This is a hypothesis. Somebody is saying that at every age group, age group, boys are taller than girls. So if we compare 10-year-olds, 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds, the average height of the boys would be, high, at all, uh, will be more than the average height of girls. This is the hypothesis. Name any three steps in the planning process that must be considered. Remember, they're asking you for the planning and not the method. They're not asking you to give them the method. They're asking you when you're planning this thing, what are the steps that you are going to follow? And remember, whether you're planning a wedding, whether you are planning a matric farewell, whether you are planning a reunion, whether you are planning a procedure, certain basic things you have to overlap. <coughs> and they are... First of all, we must determine a sample size that would be large enough and manageable. We must decide, if we want to do this thing, how many people are we going to use? We must also determine who are we going to use, where are we going to do this? Keep the number of boys and girls the same for each group. We must also, again, here determine time, venue, and date. When are we going to do that? Design a table to record the results. Before we go there, how? We must first of all decide on how we're going to record the results. Or how are we going to ga gather the information? Set up accurate measuring equipment. That means if you want to measure height, how can you plan that when you come there now you don't have anything to measure the height? What are we going to use? Fingers? Rulers? We can't. It could take too long and it's inaccurate. Determine the time span of the investigation. Generally, we must finish this investigation in a short time. Mustn't waste too much time. Maintain the same nutritional status, same socioeconomic backgrounds. And keep the conditions in the sample all the same. 
So these are some of the planning. Also, we would add here, we must get permission. We can't just go and do an investigation in the school without getting permission. We must get permission. And then we can carry on with this. Can you see there's lots of things that you, you're doing normally? The results of the learner's investigation are shown in the graph below. There's the results now. They're showing you a graph, the age as the independent variable, the average height in centimeters on the dependent variable. And notice they started here at 130. They didn't start at 0, and they started here at 10. They have license to do that. If you're doing an experiment or you're doing a graph, you don't do that unless you show it properly. So the yellow is the girls, and the white is the boys. So they're showing you there what's happening with the graph. Okay. At what age is the average age height, average height of the boys and girls the same? Obviously, you have to look at this graph and look at the point where the two lines cross each other. And in this particular graph, that is here. And that's going to come down there between 13 and 14. If that's 12 and that's 14, that would be 13. So between 13 and 14 years is where the average height of the boys and the girls is the same. Right? If you want to be more accurate, 13,4 to 13,6. Somewhere there. In fact, I wouldn't even give a mark for 13,4. We've given a range, but I wouldn't give a mark for 13,4 because it's clearly after the halfway mark. It's actually between 13,6 and 13,8 I would give the mark for. Provide a caption for the graph. Notice this graph did not have a caption. That's something that you learners do very often. When you are given a graph, you must have a caption. The caption must have both variables. The two variables here are age and average height. So our heading or caption should be average height of boys and girls of different age groups between 10 and 18 years. So we're very specific about it. But the most important part of this is this, the dependent variable and the independent variable, the different age groups and height. Notice we don't have to say line graph showing this. You don't have to say that. You can start straight with the heading itself. So one mark for that, one mark for that. But normally in exams, when you're drawing a graph, you only get one mark for that caption. If you have something missing, you get zero. There's no half mark there. Should the grade 12 learners accept the hypothesis as a possible explanation of the result? We have to go back to the hypothesis. At each age group, boys are taller than girls. What did the result show us? Between 10 and 14, ah, the girls were taller. And after 14, generally the boys were. So obviously we have to reject the hypothesis. We do not accept it or we reject it because it's not true. Give a reason. There we already gave you the reason. The girls are taller than the boys at a younger age between 10 to 13. Or the boys are shorter than the girls at a younger age between. The boys are not taller than the girls at all age groups. These are your possible answers that you could have given. The whole idea is that it does not support, the evidence does not support the hypothesis. With that, let's take a small break and we get back as soon as we're done to real solving of problems. Hi, Mindsetters. Welcome back. I'm hoping you sorted your lives out. You run to the toilet, wherever you wanted to go. You're back now, and you are giving us your 100% attention. We are now busy with question three, and as I promised you, we are working our appetite towards solving problems. And that brings us to question three, a very, 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 very basic question on solving problems. The diagram below, again, do homework. When you're answering genetic problems, always do your homework properly. The diagram below shows a crossing between homozygous black mouse and a homozygous white mouse. The F1 generation was all black. What does that tell you? That black is dominant. Black is dominant, homework. And if this was homozygous black, that means that would have been that. And if this was homozygous white, this could have been that. Because they are homozygous and because that's recessive, we use small letter. For that one, we use capital letters. 
So they give you a drawing just to show you also. There's the male, white, female, black. And, oh, where are we here? All right. And we say, what's this one now? But it, it, it can, can get confusing. So telling you here, there's the white mouse here, and the female is black, and all the offspring are white. Use the symbol B and B for the alias of fur color and show diagrammatically a genetic cross between the original black male and white female and between mouse 1 and mouse 3 to show the possible genotypes and phenotypes F1 and F2. All right? The colors on the diagram would be confusing but remember we said that's the story there so when we start we say that the p1 original what do they want a black male and white female that is that means we are looking at homozygous black and homozygous white ah sorry where are we going with this Phenotype, remember we put P1 here first, then we put phenotype, and the phenotype is black and white. The genotype is capital B, capital B, because black is dominant, and small b, small b, because white is do uh, recessive. Meiosis then takes place, we can even write meiosis in here to make more sense, and that results in gametes being formed, that is B and B, and B and B. We can either use a line diagram or a Punnett square to answer the question. Let's use a, a line diagram first. This line diagram is saying this B, would that B? That would give us capital B, small b. And you'll notice that our answer is going to be the same right across. Because these are identical and these are identical, we can only get one type of offspring and that's heterozygous. And they will all be black. 100% black and 100% heterozygous. And let's do it here now. Capital B, capital B, small b, small b, capital B, small b, capital B, small b, capital B, small b, capital B, small b. 100% heterozygous. Notice that this, you wrote here F1. To your mark allocation is important. You're getting one mark for that. And if you had meiosis and fertilization in the right places, you get one mark for that. Now imagine if you got this whole thing wrong, you would have got two marks out of six just for using the correct format. Hence, we put the format on the board so you can see it. Okay? If we want to then obviously go one step further, let's just take out Tabo and Octavia there. I don't know where they came from. Okay? There's no Tabo and Octavia. We didn't name our rats. Now they said take the offspring and the offspring are black and another one is black now we must change this also to p2 because we are looking at the next generation our phenotype is black our genotype now are heterozygous because we're taking the offspring Wait, don't make it an h if meiosis takes place we're going to do the same thing b b and b b b separating i'm not doing the line diagram i'm only doing the punnett square b small b capital B, small b. That and that gives us two capital Bs. That and that gives us capital B, small b. That and that gives us small b, big b. Remember, we can write this as b, b, or b, b. It doesn't make a difference. It's still heterozygous. And the last one is small b, small b. So now, our genotype is b, 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 and small b, small b. So look at what we got here. We got one homozygous dominant is to two heterozygous is to one homozygous recessive. And our phenotype is one, two, three. Why? Because of the law of dominance. This is black. This is black because when the big one is there, the small one can't show. So that is three black is to one white or 75% black is to 25% white. 
Notice, when we take two homozygous, all will be heterozygous. But when we take two heterozygous, we will always get 1 is to 2 is to 1 and 3 is to 1 uh, phenotype. Good. Let me go back there. I want you to see the format, people, guys. Just have a look at that format. You need to look at that format so that you understand what's happening. Good. Let's move on. Clones are a group of genetically identical organisms. Explain three advantages and three disadvantages. Explain. The word is explain. Three advantages, three disadvantages with reasons of cloning. It's a straightforward question, and I told you, I spoke about it earlier, that this question is asked often, and the answer is normally the same. First of all, advantages. Producing individuals with desired traits. That's why we do it and or to eliminate unwanted characteristics. Better yield, we want more quickly, so we get clones, it gets better so that we can get more food. We can link this to food security and environment. We can, co we can make clones of organisms that are resistant to diseases, to save on the use of pesticides and herbicides. We can make organisms in a shorter time to increase the yield. We can save endangered species, if some organism is endangered, we make clones so that organism won't become extinct. We can produce body parts. For example, I got a problem with my kidney. I can't find a donor. They make a proper kidney clone from one of my tissue cells, and then I have a new kidney to carry on. Produce offspring for organs that are infertile. You cannot have a, a, a offspring, so they create a clone from one of the two parents, and you have a baby. Reproduction is not seasonally dependent. That means reproduction can take place all the time. Disadvantages, again, you're getting your objection by religious or culture. We also, more biologically now, we reduce the gene pool. Why? Because we're creating organs that have an advantage, and the normal varieties will disappear eventually. Clone organs may have developmental morphological problems and not survive long. We don't know this yet. It can be costly, so not everybody can afford it. May generate experimental waste causing ethical issues around disposal of waste. May also lead to killing of clones to obtain body parts. If we take it further in the human sphere, organisms that have, uh, uh, humans that have criminal minds can use it for their criminal activities. The last question then, the ability to roll your tongue to form a tube is passed on from parents to the children. The inability to roll a tongue is a recessive trait. So if you have the ability to roll your tongue, you are, it's a dominant one. And the inability is a recessive trait. Tabo can roll his tongue, but his wife Octavia cannot. They have four children. The two boys, Keketso and Bongani, can roll their tongues. The two girls, Kwake, Kawe, Kazi, and Bongiwe, cannot. Use T to represent the character of the tongue for rolling, and T for the inability of the, uh, uh, to roll a tongue. Use a genetic cross to supply the genotypes of all the parents, Bongani and Kawakazi, show all your working. So we started off with Tabo and Octavia. Tabo can roll his tongue. So that means Tabo must have at least one of the dominant gene. Octavia, on the other hand, cannot. And what do they tell you about that? Inability is a recessive. And to be recessive, you must have both the two alleles. Now, what did they have? They had children. The two boys, Kakeshka and Bogani, can roll their tongue, and the two girls, Kawekazi and Bongiwe, cannot. So that means they had children that could not roll their tongue. What does that tell you about Tabo? Tabo had to have the small t, because the children could have only inherited two t's, one from each parent. So that's our starting point. And when meiosis takes place, we'll have that and that and two small t's there. 
And we go here to the Punnett square, capital T, small t, small t, small t. Why is this one small t, small t? Because it's a recessive characteristic. The minute there's a capital T, that means the person can roll the tongue. If they don't have that capital T, that means they can't roll their tongue. And hence we will have capital D, capital T, small t, capital T, small t, small t, small t, small t, small t. This will explain why some of the children cannot roll their tongues while other children can roll their tongues. Although in this example, they gave you a 50%, 50%, just like the result, it doesn't mean that if this situation was the case, then half of our children will be able to roll their tongue and half won't. It simply means every time fertilization takes place, there's a 50% chance of having a child who will be able to roll their tongue and a 50% chance of a child who would not be able to roll their tongue. Don't ever think that this is the first child, that's the second child, that's the third child, and that's the fourth child. It means every time fertilization takes place, these are the probabilities of the results that are going to show themselves in the offspring. I'm hoping Mindset is that I have helped you to understand how to solve problems and also to deal with theoretical problems. With that, goodbye and good luck in learning genetics.